Okay. Um, so today we're going to talk about infections of the respiratory tract. And um, this is chapter 21 uh, in the book. And when we um, Sorry. Uh, so starting off like every other chapter, we'll talk a little bit about the anatomy. Um, so the respiratory tract can be broken up into the upper and lower respiratory tracts. The upper is going to be your mouth, nose, nasal cavity, sinuses, uh, throat, which is your pharynx, epiglottis, and the larynx. The lower respiratory tract would be from the trachea downward into the lungs, all the way down to the alveoli. Now the defense mechanisms of the respiratory tract, you do have some anatomical defenses. This will be the nasal hairs, the ciliated epithelium of the trachea and the bronchi, the mucus on the tissue as well, um, coughing, sneezing, swallowing. Uh, you know, the mucus and the hairs will trap a lot of microorganisms that are inhaled. Uh, and if there's enough irritants there, that'll trigger either a cough or a sneeze. Uh, which will help to expel from, from that area. The uh, second uh, and third line of defenses, you do have complement action in the lungs. Complement is uh, a series of proteins that will uh, essentially kill bacteria. You have increased levels of cytokines and antimicrobial proteins. These are also going to kill bacteria. And then you'll have various resident macrophages that are in the lungs. Uh, and these macrophages will phagocytize anything uh, that might end up uh, being there. Okay. Okay, so normal microbiota that we typically find in the respiratory tract. Uh, this is not a sterile site by any means, uh, especially the upper respiratory tract. The lower respiratory tract, yes, you should not really have any resident organisms living in the bronchi downward. So the bronchi, the bronchioles, the alveoli, those should all be sterile sites. But the upper respiratory tract, you will definitely have lots of microorganisms, normal microbiota that's present there. Um, metagenomic analysis revealed that both the upper and lower respiratory tracts actually harbor large numbers of bacterial species. There are nine major bacterial genuses that make up a significant portion of the normal microbiota. Yeast, especially Canada albicans, can also colonize these mucosal surfaces. And the normal biota will play a significant role in uh, what we call microbial antagonism. What microbial antagonism is, this is competition between the good bacteria uh, and, and yeast. Uh, and essentially what that means is <coughs> you have this competition for nutrients, which is going to keep overall numbers low, um, meaning that not one particular species would be able to gain any significant numbers over the other. Now, bacteria that are considered normal biota uh, can also be considered opportunistic infection. Uh, and what we mean by opportunistic infections is they are under normal conditions, part of your normal biota or normal flora, but given the opportunity, they can actually become pathogenic and cause disease. These will include things like strep pyogenes, which can cause strep throat, homophilus influenza, uh, which can also cause pharyngitis, a sore throat, or uh, pneumonia. Uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae, which can cause pneumonia. Uh, Neisseria meningitis can cause pneumonia. Uh, and then Staph aureus. Again, these are organisms that we typically find as normal flora, but they can also lead to disease. So here's just a little table that sort of summarizes the defense mechanisms we have and the main families that are going to make up the normal uh, biota. All right, so let's talk about the first uh, disease here. And the first one is the common cold. It's often called rhinitis, which is going to involve the nose and inflammation. Many people have several colds per year in the United States. It attributes to $40 billion per year in medical costs. 
and 22 million missed days of work. Although interestingly, uh, in the early days of COVID during the first year, the numbers of people complaining or reporting with the common cold actually decreased significantly, uh, mainly because there was a lot of hygiene practices in place and most people were wearing masks at the time. Signs and symptoms, everything you're gonna find on the side of a NyQuil bottle, uh, sneezing, scratchy throat, runny nose. Generally with the common cold, you will not have a fever uh, and infection can predispose patients to secondary infections. What that means is if you start off with the common cold, you can actually end up with a little bit more of a serious respiratory infection that might be caused by a bacterial species. Now the causative agents of the common cold, over 200 different kinds of viruses can cause the common cold. Uh, there have been 99 different serotypes of rhinoviruses plus coronaviruses and adenoviruses. Um, you know, coronavirus is not a new thing. Uh, it typically causes the common cold, except, you know, this more recent series of strains uh, tend to be, you know, pretty severe. Symptoms usually are due to the immune response to the virus, not particularly any virulence factors associated with the organism or the virus. Uh, and it's transmitted by droplet contact and indirect transmission. There is no vaccine uh, for the main reason that <clears throat> there's so many different potential causes. Uh, it would be impossible to sort of develop a vaccine. There's also no specific chemotherapeutic agent. Essentially what you're taking are over-the-counter drugs, which are just, uh, in essence, just masking symptoms. So here's the table that sort of goes over the common cold. Again, approximately about 200 different viruses, primarily your rhinoviruses, adenoviruses, and coronaviruses. Um, and the, the best preventive for here uh, is, uh, you know, hygiene practices. Sinusitis, this is a sinus infection. Uh, this is an inflammatory condition of any of the four pairs of sinuses of the skull. Uh, it can be caused by an allergy or an infection and patients suffering from a cold office times can develop sinusitis as well. Signs and symptoms, you'll have sinus pain, nasal congestion, pressure, headache, and a toothache. Uh, discharge with sinusitis typically is opaque and can be yellow or green in color. Typical uh, causative agents for sinusitis is most common would be viruses. Um, however, uh, most often the normal biota can lead to sinusitis as well uh, on the bacterial side and the pathogenesis, the actual cause of the infection is due to underlying infection, buildup of fluids which provide rich bacteria medium and the anatomy of the sinuses which then can entrap the bacteria with the mucus. Uh, fungal species for sinusitis is actually quite rare, <coughs> but it's often recognized when antibacterial drugs fail to alleviate any of the symptoms. And here's your little summary table on sinusitis. Uh, acute otitis media, this is an ear infection. Uh, this could also be another sequela of the common cold, meaning a secondary infection that arises from the common cold. Uh, and for similar reasons, uh, viral infections can cause inflammation in the eustachian tube uh, and the buildup of the fluid in the middle ear. The bacteria can migrate there uh, and then increase uh, the inflammatory response. Uh, in chronic otis media, otitis media, uh, fluid builds up in the eustachian tubes, uh, and new data suggests that these infections are most often biofilm infections. And unfortunately, with biofilms, um, they tend to be a lot less effective. Uh, antibiotics tend to be a lot less effective with them versus uh, non-biofilm infections. One way to sort of deal with these chronic infections is to have tubes put in the ears which will help to drain that fluid so you don't get that buildup. Uh, signs and symptoms of otitis media, you'll feel a fullness or pain in the ear. Sometimes you can have clogged hearing or loss of hearing. 
Uh, with young children, you'll have irritability, trouble sleeping, eating, or hearing. Uh, the infection can cause the eardrum to burst and more serious infections then can result. Um, you know, most often it's just watchful waiting for 72 hours. Uh, and like I said, if you have recurrent infections, tubes uh, can actually help to alleviate that. Uh, unfortunately, I was that child uh, that had to have several tubes uh, put in my ears because I had very chronic uh, ear infections. Uh, but, and that's also something you typically will tend to grow out of. Uh, an infected middle ear, uh, like I said, it's really this area right here um, that's going to be an issue, okay? And you can get information of the uh, eardrum there. <coughs> and here's our disease table for that. Um, pharyngitis, uh, something I have right now. Uh, signs and symptoms, uh, inflammation of the throat causing pain and swelling. Uh, inflammatory packets can be visible on the walls of the throat, difficult swallowing, foul breath. That's very common if it's a bacterial infection. If it's viral, uh, typically you'll have mild and sometimes lead to hoarseness, but you won't have those plaque build up on the back of the throat. Uh, bacterial infections are much, much more painful. And oftentimes bacterial uh, pharyngitis will be associated with headache, nausea, and a fever. And here you can actually see, looking in the back of the throat, you can see these white patches, uh, which is essentially the bacterial plaques that are sort of formed there. Uh, and oftentimes you can even get a little bit of an odor depending on the, the, the causative agent here. Um, strep pyogenes is a very common uh, bacteria if bacteria is involved in pharyngitis. Uh, most pharyngitis, again, will be viral, but uh, if you do have a strep pyogenes, this is a gram-positive coccus that grows in chains. Uh, untreated strep infections can result in serious complications. Uh, mo more, most serious would be uh, inflammation of the valves in the heart, uh, which can cause uh, an infection on those valves, and that can be difficult to treat sometimes. Uh, we'll talk about this when we get to the cardiovascular system, but treating uh, infections on the heart valves, uh, the most recommended treatment is actually to replace the heart valve. Now, strep pyogenes will have several virulence factors. These are surface antigens on the strep pyogenes that will help to mimic host proteins. The surface antigens will protect the organism from being affected by lysozyme. Uh, streptolysin O and streptolysin S, these can actually injure the tissues or damage the tissues. Uh, and then you can also release various types of toxins, uh, which can cause an exasperation of the whole uh, infection. Now, strep throat is, is not very common in adults, although not impossible. Uh, it is more common in children, and most pediatric offices will have these quick strep tests where you take a swab, go in the back of the mouth, and then, you know, mix it with the little reagents, and you look for a positive test. Uh, it's very similar to the, if you've, if you had a COVID test, uh, it's very similar to how those are set up. And the nice thing is, is you can get a, 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 a positive or negative uh, pretty quickly, usually within about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, this is important because, you know, if the child actually does have strep throat, um, you don't want to, you want to treat with antibiotics because uh, the longer you wait, the worse it's going to get. Um, All right, and then here's the table that sort of summarizes the uh, different types of pharyngitis that can result. Uh, diphtheria, this can cause significant morbidity and mortality for hundreds of, has caused significant morbidity and mortality for hundreds of years. Uh, we do have immunizations against diphtheria now, and this has actually caused cases to decline significantly. Uh, epidemics and smaller outbreaks have occurred due to the breakdown of immunity due to lack of vaccination. 
Uh, the, the vaccination for this is the DTaF vaccine, which is the diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis uh, vaccines. We'll talk about pertussis also today. We talked about tetanus with infections of the skin. The causative agent for diphtheria is uh, an exotoxin, which is manufactured by a bacteria called Corneum bacterium diphtheriae. Uh, and this actually causes a pseudomembrane to form in the back of the tonsils. Uh, and Corneum bacterium diphtheriae actually has a very distinct odor that if you smelt it once, you'll always remember it. And uh, if you have a patient that has diphtheria, unfortunately, it's going to sort of come off on their breath. Uh, and you, you know, a seasoned doctor that's seen this before can sort of do a little quick diagnosis just based on uh, the odor. Uh, the DTaP vaccine is recommended for children with the Tdap booster for individuals 11 to 64. And again, here's a summary table for corneal bacterium diphtheria. Whooping cough, this is uh, pertussis. Whooping cough starts off as a normal respiratory tract infection, and then it will progress about a week to 10 days in, uh, which you'll go into the paroxysmal phase where you have uncontrollable coughing and accompanied by a whoop sound, uh, this wheezing sound. Uh, can result in broken blood vessels in the eyes, vomiting, or hemorrhaging. This is due to the abdominal pressure being built up from all the coughing. And then eventually you go into the convalescent stage two weeks after the paroxysmal stage. This is where the bacteria are decreasing, uh, but the ciliated epithelia have been damaged. And this can require weeks to months for full recovery. The causative agent for whooping cough is Bordetella pertussis. Uh, and this particular bacteria does release the pertussis toxin, which causes massive mucus production. Uh, you also have the tracheal cytotoxin, which causes direct destruction of the ciliated cells. There is a pertussis vaccine. Again, it's part of that DTaP vaccine uh, or Tdap booster for anywhere from 11 to 64. Uh, we do have high vaccine coverage, but there are pockets. Uh, and we do start to see some outbreaks of whooping cough every once in a while in the adult population. Okay, uh, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. This infects the respiratory tract and it produces giant multinucleated cells. Uh, outbreaks occur around the world. Peak incidence is in winter and early spring. And this is something that's of concern for newborns. Uh, mortality is the highest among premature infants those with congenital disease or immunodeficiencies. Signs of RSV is fever lasting three days, rhinitis, pharyngitis, and otitis. More serious infections, you'll have progress to the bronchial tree and uh, symptoms of croup and difficulty breathing. Transmission is highly contagious and passive antibody therapy is oftentimes the most effective uh, where the antibody therapy is coming from say a parent um, and that can be transfused in to um, sort of treat this. <coughs> um, the big thing with this is babies that have RSV, they can go into respiratory distress, especially newborns, uh, very easily. Uh, it's not like an adult or a child where it's not as such a rapid decline. Uh, and oftentimes uh, that's what can help to attribute to the high mortality rates with this. Okay, the flu. Um, reasons to study the flu or influenza. Uh, we do have an annual flu season that has potential for turning deadly for many people very quickly. Uh, typically, the flu will affect those that are immune compromised, uh, the very young and the very old. Now, many diseases are erroneously termed the flu. And behavior of the influenza viruses illustrates how viruses can and do cause more serious diseases than they did previously. Uh, signs and symptoms of the flu, you have headaches, chills, dry cough, body aches, fever, stuffy nose, and sore throat. Uh, you can have extreme fatigue, which can last for a few days or weeks. Uh, and then you have uh, 
for example, you can also have some uh, <clears throat> other symptoms such as what we saw with H1N1, swine flu. Uh, not all patients had a fever, but many patients had gastrointestinal distress or developed multi-organ system failure. Now you have uh, two different uh, spikes on the surface, uh, hemagglutin uh, and neuroruminase. This is what we call the HA or NA uh, spikes. And this is what actually changes uh, from season to season. Uh, this is called an anagenic drift um, where you have gradual changing of amino acids of the influenza antigens. Uh, this results in decreased ability of the host memory cells to recognize them. The antigenic shift, this is a swapping out of one of the strands of the viral RNA with uh, a gene or a strand from another virus, no recognition by the host memory cells. And this often uh, results in influenza pandemics. Prevention of the flu, there are three major types of influenza vaccines in the United States. You have an intramuscular inactivated vaccine with three strains of influenza in it. You have an intramuscular inactivated vaccine with four strains. <coughs> and there's also the inhaled uh, vaccine. Scientists are continually researching emerging strains to attempt to help prevent the pandemic. Uh, but keep in mind that with the flu, uh, the vaccines that they come out from year to year are educated guesses. And uh, sometimes the vaccines have very good efficacy and some years they do not. Uh, and here's the uh, flu data table. Uh, and just, just to let you guys know, you know, in the US we typically do see uh, about 17 to 52,000 deaths per year uh, from the flu. And that's mainly in, again, the very young and the very old, especially the very old elderly population. Tuberculosis, uh, this is a very old, old disease. Uh, it was found in mummies from the Stone Age, ancient Egypt and Peru. Um, streptomycin reduces the rate significantly. We do have uh, a re-emerging uh, disease. We do see drug resistant strains that are floating out there. And those are of more concern. Uh, the HIV epidemic has unfortunately led to a little bit of a balloon of TB infections, and nearly one third of the world's population is infected with TB. I would say prior pre-COVID, uh, this is probably the most infectious human disease on the planet. It'd be interesting to compare the numbers of COVID uh, to the numbers of TB to see if COVID has now uh, surpassed the Primary tuberculosis, the infectious dose is very small. You only need about 10 bacterial cells. The bacteria continue to grow inside the alveolar macrophages. Uh, and you can end up with these granulomas, which contain a core of TB bacteria in the enlarged macrophages and in the outer wall, which is made up of fibroblasts, lymphocytes, and macrophages. They can become necrotic caseous lesions and then these lesions can eventually calcify. Um, extrapulmonary tuberculosis, the organs that are typically involved in extrapulmonary, meaning outside the lungs, TB, you can have regional lymph nodes, intestines, kidneys, your long bones, uh, the genital tract, brain, and the meninges. Some people will end up with a reactivation of TB. Uh, the bacteria remain dormant in the lungs for weeks, months, or years later. They can become reactivated when the immunity wanes. Uh, severe symptoms can include violent coughing, greenish or bloody sputum, low-grade fever, anorexia, weight loss, fatigue, night sweats, chest pain. Uh, all these symptoms combined are what we typically refer to as consumption. Uh, untreated disease has a 60% mortality rate. Um, Tuberculosis is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, this is a long, thin, acid-fast rod. Uh, so you would actually use an acid-fast stain uh, to detect uh, tuberculosis. So you can essentially take some sputum from a patient, uh, throw it on a microscope slide, do an acid-fast test, and if it comes back positive, most likely TB. Acid-fast test is actually testing for the mycolic acid in the cell wall.
Um, and here you can see uh, this is an acid fast test looking at uh, the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, transmission is through fine droplets of respiratory mucus suspended in the air. Uh, so essentially just spread aerosolized. Epidemiological patterns vary with the living conditions of a community or area of the world. Uh, TB is an infection of poverty uh, where you have inadequate infect nutrition, debilitation of the immune system, poor access to medical care, lung damage, and overall genetics. Uh, there are various types of tests to determine if you have TB or have an infection of TB. The most common is the PPD test. I'm sure everyone has had this at least once, if not multiple times in their life. Uh, they inject essentially an antigen and they look for a reaction, which will occur in 48 to 72 hours later. And you'll sort of see this inflammatory bump sort of appear. Now, if you have been vaccinated against TB, uh, you will come back positive with a PPD test. If you also have been infected with TB prior, but no longer have an active infection, you'll come back positive with a PPD test, okay? And individuals that come back positive with a PPD test, whether legit or not, uh, are screened by a chest X-ray. Uh, that's really the only definitive uh, way of looking at this besides you know, the, the various stains themselves. Treatment uh, for the first two months, uh, they'll give you uh, antibiotics like rifampin, uh, and then you'll go on to four to seven months uh, using two or three drugs, uh, depending on susceptibility testing, to make sure that you don't end up with any drug resistance. Uh, treatment can be up to eight months worth of antibiotics. It's not a quick course. Uh, patients, patient non-compliance of taking the drugs for the full period of time is oftentimes an issue. And that's what can lead to multi-drug resistance TB. Multi-drug resistance TB means that it is resistant to uh, <coughs> two or more antibiotics. And then extensively drug resistant tuberculosis is I think three or more. And then here's the data table on TB. Now pneumonia, uh, anatomical diagnosis for pneumonia is inflammatory condition in the lung in which fluid fills the alveoli. This can be caused by a wide variety of microorganisms and it must be able to uh, avoid phagocytosis or avoid being killed once inside the macrophages. Viral pneumonia is usually, but not always milder than bacterial pneumonia. And fungi can also cause pneumonia, and that's the most severe. Signs and symptoms of pneumonia begins with running nose, and congestion, headache, and fever. Uh, lung sy symptoms will include chest pain, fever, cough, production of discolored sputum. Patient appears pale and sickly due to pain and difficulty breathing. <coughs> and the severity and speed of the onset of symptoms depends really on the etiological agent, meaning what's causing it. Essentially with pneumonia, what you have is you have fluid buildup within the alveolar of the lungs. Unfortunately, if you have this fluid buildup uh, that takes those particular alveoli out of the running for gas exchange and your overall oxygenation can start to fall because you don't have uh, as much landscape to accomplish uh, gas exchange. Uh, we have community acquired pneumonia. This is caused by Streptococcus pneumoniae. Uh, factors that enhance the disease are old age, season, underlying viral respiratory disease, diabetes, chronic abuse of alcohol or narcotics. There is a vaccine for Streptococcus pneumoniae uh, and it's recommended for diabetics. It's also recommended for older patients over the age of 65. Uh, Streptococcus pneumonia does contain a polysaccharide capsule, and this capsule actually helps it to prevent phagocytosis. This is, this is significant because in the alveolar of the lungs, you do have these resident macrophages, but because of this capsule, those macrophages can't actually uh, take care of the streptococcus pneumonia. 
The vaccine for streptococcus pneumoniae is encouraged for children and older adults. Uh, and if you also remember, streptococcus pneumoniae is a cause for met certain types of meningitis as well from uh, the prior chapter 19. <clears throat> Mycoplasma pneumonia, this is atypical pneumonia. Symptoms do not resemble those of pneumonia or other types of pneumococcal pneumonia. They do lack a cell wall. Uh, and this is what we typically refer to as walking pneumonia. Well, walking pneumonia means is feel like crap. Uh, but it's not enough to land you in the hospital bed. Uh, most likely, this can also be treated with oral antibiotics instead of IV antibiotics. Uh, Legionella pneumophila. Uh, this is actually um, a cause of pneumonia. It's widely distributed in aqueous environments, tap water, cooling towers, spas, ponds, and fresh water. It is an optimistic pathogen that affects elderly people. It's really rarely seen in healthy individuals and in adults. Uh, this is actually first discovered in 1976 in the American Legion Convention. Uh, this is actually discovered in Philadelphia uh, in the Bellevue Hotel on South Broad Street. Uh, it was one of the first hotels to sort of get the Okay, sorry, I had to pause for a second. Um, so I believe I was left off with saying that Legionella pneumophila was actually discovered in Philadelphia initially at the Bellevue Hotel on South Broad Street. Um, and actually, if you look at the name, Legionella is in reference to the American Legion and Phila, pneumophila is in reference to Philadelphia. Um, it was one of the first hotels to actually get an HVAC system, air, air conditioning. It was a hot, humid day in Philadelphia. And they had a lot of moisture build up within the HVAC system and it became aerosolized. The American Legion was a bunch of older men who were drinking and smoking heavily. Uh, and it was just a perfect scenario. And unfortunately, quite a few of them died as a result of pneumonia. And uh, the hospitals had no idea what was causing this pneumonia. And they eventually identified this particular species in 1976. Uh, histoplasma, uh, this is Darling's disease, Ohio Valley, or fever. Um, this can be benign or severe, acute or chronic. And this is really something that you really only see in uh, immune compromised patients. If you have a functional immune system, this is not something that you should have to deal with. And there are several states that this is quite prevalent in. Uh, and these two tables will summarize the different uh, causative agents for pneumonia. You also have about what we call healthcare associated pneumonia. <clears throat> about 1% of hospitalized or institutionalized, meaning in a long term care facility, uh, people can develop pneumonia. Um, it's most often associated with individuals that are actually on a ventilator um, or have uh, either ventilator through endotracheal or a tracheostomy tube. Uh, and this can actually have a 50, 30 to 50% mortality rate. So the mortality rate is pretty high. Uh, you can see the causative agents here. Uh, again, streptococcus pneumonia is the most common community acquired. You can see some of the organisms here. These are what we call the hospital acquired versions. Um, and a lot of these like MRSA or E. coli are things that are very common infections in hospitals. Um, prevention and treatment of healthcare associated pneumonia. Most causes are due to aspiration from the upper respiratory tract. Uh, elevation of patient's heads to 30 to 45 degree angles helps to reduce aspiration of secretions. Deep breathing and frequent coughing help. Proper care of ventilation and respiratory equipment and empiric antibiotic therapy should be started as soon as healthcare associated pneumonia is suspected. Uh, and here's the table for that. And then finally, the next two slides are just the summary of the different organisms that can cause respiratory tract infections. Uh, and then this is just the last slide of every one of these chapters where it sort of has the um, various areas and the types of infections that can be caused. And that is it for the respiratory tract infections.